all of us are familiar with two ways ideas come to mind. So if I say two plus two, something came to your mind. If I say 17 times 24, then nothing came to your mind and you probably would have to produce it. Uh, you'd have to generate it in a slow and effortful process. So some thoughts are like two plus two, and this is in some cases how a physician would make a quick diagnosis. All of that is what I call fast thinking, or system one thinking. The 17 times 24 is one of many examples in which we reason slowly and effortfully, and that is slow thinking or system two thinking. And when I speak of system two, I speak of that, of effortful computation and also of monitoring and control, because self-control is another effortful operation. System one, the automatic kind of thinking, is something that clearly grew out of our animal heritage. I mean, animals uh, uh, perceive the world and they perceive causality, and uh, there is a great deal of understanding of the world that, that is shared. System two is distinctively human, and and it is our ability to reason and our ability to delay gratification and to control ourselves. There's a great deal, and that is evolutionarily late. And, you know, it, it allows us to do great things, but System 1 is mostly in charge of what we do most of the time. Whenever people remodel a kitchen, uh, now they, and, and they have an idea of how much they're willing to pay and they have an idea of how much it will cost. They may also know that for most people it costs on average about twice as much as they originally planned. But you don't feel that this applies to yourself. So you have that knowledge which somehow is disembodied and is part of, you know, it, it's available to you, you know it, but you don't apply it. And that is, that failure to apply it is characteristic of System 1. It doesn't use statistics very well, and it doesn't apply statistics to specific cases. A great deal of prejudice is, you know, is built in, and, and to some extent is uncontrollable. I mean, it's something that we, have to, that we have to accept as a fact of life. We have stereotypes about everything. We have stereotypes about tables, and certainly we have stereotypes about, about social groups. Now, here is clearly a case where you would want System 2 uh, to be in control and because you may not want to say everything that's on your mind and you may realize and try to confront your your own stereotypes and indeed in in some cases people can improve themselves by thinking can improve their stereotypes by thinking more deeply so that even their initial reactions will be modified organizations and institutions can improve the way they make judgments and decision making, by searching for biases and by trying to reduce the impact of biases on their decisions. And that is a process of self-critique, I call it quality control over decisions, which I think is feasible within reason. You, want, you don't want too much of it because you don't want what is called paralysis by analysis. But within reason, there is room for many organizations to improve what they do by a form of quality control. If you ask what is the role of biases in the crisis of 2008, there is one place where we certainly can, can see it, and this is the over-optimism of people who bought those mortgages that they could not afford. So they were making a classic mistake. Then there was a lot of optimism among the bankers who packaged those things, but that is more explainable by standard economics because they had an incentive to do those things. But the people who bought the mortgages, they were biased, they were wrong, they were making a mistake.
next. Let's go to the thought bubble. One of the most popular experiments in behavioral economics is called the ultimatum game. In this experiment, two players decide how to share a specific sum of money, let's say $100. The first player is given all the money and then is asked to propose a way of splitting it with the second player. Now, if the second player accepts the deal, both players get to keep the money. But if the second player refuses, nobody gets to keep the money. When the first player offers to split the money 50-50, the second player almost always accepts. But what happens when the first player offers an unequal split, like 80-20? Would you accept that offer? Well, it turns out the less equal offers are often rejected. Now that doesn't seem surprising, but it directly contradicts classical economic theory. It's irrational. The rational choice would be for the second player to accept any offer, even if it's only a dollar. I mean, after all, a dollar is better than nothing. But human behavior is not motivated solely by gain. It's also shaped by complex ideas like fairness, injustice, and even revenge. The ultimatum game shows that people aren't always as predictable as many economists like to suggest. If people were entirely rational, they would consistently make the same decision given identical options. But sometimes people's preferences are dependent on how the options are presented. Psychologists call this type of cognitive